Hello boys and girls. Today we're off to the classroom to learn about flatties and their pitfalls. As many can attest, when you join the censored earth community, you are given a new set of eyes. Now I've studied earth science before, but now that I've been given a new set of eyes, I'm going to go back and take another look and tell you what I see. This is Modern Earth Science Destroyed. Chapter 2.3 Artificial satellite. Isn't it kind of rude to knock down someone else's block tower? Is it rude to expose and point out academic tiger traps like these and destroy them? No. Good, good, good. So you'll have no problem with me pointing out your intellectual fails then, will you? Fair is fair after all. They create academic tiger traps. I see no shame in destroying those. Exactly. Now let's see what pitfalls we can find this time. Okay, I'm game. Let's see what pitfalls you can make. And the boys and girls will look and watch too. If you drop a ball, it will fall straight down because the force of gravity pulls objects toward the center of the earth. If you throw a ball horizontally, it will follow a curving path. A ball thrown at about 8 kilometers a second and not slowed down by air resistance would follow the curve of the earth. As shown in figure 2-11, the ball would fall toward the Earth, but never reach the Earth's curved surface. Instead, the ball would become an artificial Earth satellite. A satellite is any object in orbit around another body with a larger mass. Do you see any pitfalls mentioned there? Nope, but I bet you might think you have. Don't you reckon, boys and girls? Well, they did mention gravity three different times there. As I remember back in chapter 2.1, we pointed out how gravity is a fictitious force. Yeah, treating fictitious forces as if they were real? That is just like treating this ground as if it were real. That is a pitfall for sure. See, what he has done there, boys and girls, is pick a cherry. He has locked onto one word, didn't he? And misunderstood all the way to a cherry pie. What a silly billy. I think it's interesting how they claim the ball would never reach the Earth's surface. Here they mentioned 8 kilometers per second, which I can't help but think is a rounded number for the speed of the International Space Station that is said to orbit the Earth at 7.66 kilometers per second. Did you see the silly little weasel words that he used there, boys and girls? That's his tricky wicky way of how to cast an itty teeny weeny bit of doubt on the ISS. Now, the ISS does move at 7.6 kilometers per second, doesn't it, boys and girls? Well, yes, it does. How do we know? Well, a couple of clever chaps a year ago called Ruhif Wade's Underworld and Where's Wally, they timed the ISS as it flew all the way across the sky from Sydney to Brisbane. And it took 110 seconds to zip along those 704 kilometers. That is a change in displacement over time, isn't it, boys and girls? Who remembers what we call that? Yes, speed. And for the three different pairs of measurements that we got, we got 6.3 to 7.7 .7 kilometers per second. Now, I wonder if he's ever tried to verify the ISS speed from the ground. It's super easy to do, barely an inconvenience. The linky winky to that video is up there in the corner. It needs a regular boost or fuel injection from visiting spacecraft. If those boosts stop or something else goes wrong, sooner or later the lab will fall. So who's wrong here? Is the textbook wrong? Is space.com wrong? Or are they just unable to reach that perfect speed of eight kilometers per second? <laughs> that is interesting. Although, the book here mentions something about the ball not getting slowed down by air resistance. So perhaps Space.com's reasoning is that the space station experiences just enough air resistance to eventually send it crashing down to the Earth. And what do we call such sick burns, boys and girls? Yes, ointment and a kiss from mummy will make Kyle feel better. Those wife burns are particularly nasty. He was able to contribute an interesting article from History.com about the Skylab, which is said to have crashed back in 1979. Apparently it was a predecessor to the ISS. 
and in order to keep it up there, they would have had to give it continual boosts. But eventually people lost interest in keeping it going, so they just let it crash. Hey boys and girls, did you catch that plethora of weasel words? Yes, was said to have, apparently. Yes, very good, you got them. Did you spot the false claims too? Yes, he said. Eventually people lost interest and they let it crash. Well, you kiddies are really good at debunking, aren't you? You got both of those. Yes, you are. See, the Skylab did need to be reboosted. And it was planned to do that reboost by using the space shuttle. But the poor space shuttle took a little long to build. It was about two years too late. So by the time the space shuttle was ready, the Skylab's orbit had decayed too far to be saved. But that took like six years. How about that? Looking at the article further, the authors put a lot of emphasis here on the concern of the impact hurting someone. So they fired up the Skylab rockets and launched it at the Earth even faster. It makes you wonder why they didn't use the rockets to turn the Skylab away from the Earth and launch it out into space where it wouldn't hurt anyone. That seemed a very simple plan, until you did the maths. That is where you do add-ups and takeaways and work out that the amount of fuel needed to escape Earth's gravity was a whole heap more than they had available. So the only option was to use the last remaining fuel to try to deorbit the Skylab as safely as possible over sparsely inhabited lands or waters. And with an orbital inclination of 50 degrees, and that's very much like the ISS at 51.6 degrees, then if you live anywhere that the ISS passes over you, you would have been right underneath Skylab and it could have landed on you and embedded into your home or what was left of it. That wouldn't be fun, would it, boys and girls? Well, yes, yes, it would have broken your house and your mum and your dad and your cat and the dog and the whole street. Okay, let's move on. Debunking is meant to be fun. If you drop a ball, it will fall. That is an observation of downward force. See, boys and girls, he does observe gravity, even if he calls it by a different name. Gravity pulls objects toward the center of the Earth. That is a tiger trap because we don't see any observation supporting that claim. Okay kids, stop giggling. Yes, we all heard him say that there was a downwards force, then say that there is no evidence of a downward force. Whoopsies. If you throw a ball horizontally, it will follow a curving path. Yes, an accelerating vertical force plus a horizontal force equals a curving path. That is an observation. If you were to throw a ball at 8 kilometers a second, without any air resistance, the ball would never hit the Earth. That isn't an observation. It is a complex concept. And what makes it that is the fact that it depends on another concept in order to be true. That concept is the claim that the greater the speed at which an object is thrown, the slower it will fall. Did you clever kids catch what he meant right there? Yes, that was a big old sneezy straw man. Achoo! That's where they change what is true to something that's not true and then try to pull that apart. And like a straw man, that's really easy. The words fall slower is not correct. Achoo! I'm so allergic to straw men. I can see how that might be the case with air resistance, but without air resistance, I don't see any observations supporting that claim. And that's what makes it a tiger trap. A horizontal force can't negate or cancel out a vertical force. Yes, restating the straw man in different words is a doubling down. Good catch, boys and girls. But it's still not what anyone is saying. As we see, time, as we see the time taken to reach the ground, it's the same in this demo for both of the balls. And in this case, the ground is flat. Now, if he had put a big gym ball right underneath that, then the red ball would have missed the edge of the ball completely. It's a little bit tricky, isn't he? Here they say a satellite is any object in orbit around another body with a larger mass. What about balloon satellites? Do they orbit the Earth? Okay, playing games with words can be fun. 
Orbit does have a very specific meaning, however. We all know that we looked it up in our dictionaries. We all know that balloons just float around in the atmosphere, even the upper atmosphere. Let's look up the word orbit in the dictionary. Dictionary.com describes the word orbit as a curved path, usually elliptical, described by a planet, satellite, spaceship, etc., around a celestial body as the sun. Yes, a very specific meaning. I wonder if he wants to play more weasel word games, boys and girls. Hmm. So it seems a circular or elliptical path isn't required. Oh, that's good. Except you just read out that it is. Goldfishing is what we call this, boys and girls. He has just forgotten the word around. He left it right out. For some reason. So according to the definition, if I were to throw a ball on a curved path, that could be considered throwing a ball into orbit. Oh, okay. So as long as this balloon goes up and travels in a curved path, then that can be considered orbiting the Earth. Uh-oh. It looks like Jeff has something to say about that. He wants to emphasize the word around in our definition of orbit. Goody gumdrops. Night Sky Jeff has picked up and corrected the mistake. Never be afraid to point out errors, boys and girls. That's how we learn, isn't it? So let's take a look at the definition of the word around. In definition 5, it reads, in circumference. As in, the tree was 40 inches around. But here in definition 4, it reads, in a region or area neighboring a place. It looks like definitions 15 and 16 follow that same line of thought. Okay, so thereby, going into orbit doesn't require an object to go all the way around the Earth. Boys and girls, cherries are yummy in our tummy. But when they are picked like this, they leave a truly bad taste in our mouth. These silly billies hopscotched right over, meaning 6 and 11, and even 5, that they just mentioned, and they went with the definitions that suited their bedtime story. Oh dear. Satellites and orbits. Today, hundreds of artificial satellites orbit the Earth. Boys and girls, how many satellites has SpaceX launched in their Starlink program? Heaps? Lots? Yes, that's true, as of March. 24, 2021, SpaceX has launched 1,385 Starlink satellites. Now that's a big number, much bigger than hundreds. A quick Google gave me the NORAD active satellites list and it's showing 4,017 working satellites and the positional data for each and every one of them. Scientific satellites and orbiting telescopes are outfitted with special instruments that allow scientists to study the distant reaches of space. You know, it's a pity the book doesn't show pictures to reference any of these satellites. Oh, that's a little sneaky. How about the latest 60 Starlink birds being set free? How about that? Isn't that pretty? And what you're looking at on your screen are these Starlink satellites drifting away from second stage. This is confirming deployment of our payload. Therefore, the higher the orbit of a satellite, the lower will be the speed needed for it to stay in orbit. A satellite in geosynchronous orbit always remains at the same point above the equator and appears to be stationary in the sky. Geostationary satellites can even be seen with a decent telescope. The equinox is a great time to look as they disappear for an hour when they pop into the Earth's shadow, just like a little mini eclipse. So cute. I wonder why they claim a geosynchronous satellite has to be above the equator. A geosynchronous doesn't, but a geostationary satellite must be above the equator. It's the only place where they can be stationary. If it, was a hunt, if it was 10 degrees north of the equator, then there's more planet on the south. And so the satellite would be pulled by that extra gravity back to over the equator again. And they would wiggle backwards and forwards across the equator. There could be quite a bit more than a few hundred satellites orbiting the Earth. See, the equator is the Goldilocks zone. It's a perfect spot where everything is just right. Now have a look where they are. See this great big ring? This is where all the geostationary satellites currently are. And you can see it's getting as full as a state school hat rack. 
Did you know that according to the news, there is a worldwide helium shortage going on? Guess who the world's number one consumer of helium is? I'm going to guess NASA? It's NASA. Isn't that suspicious? Not really. When you look at what industries use helium, space is not the biggest at all. It seems NASA is the biggest single user, but many other places use more helium than NASA. It seems he's trying to make NASA look like the bogeyman again. Ooh, boo. A satellite can also be placed in a polar orbit. A polar orbit carries the satellite over the Earth's north and south poles. Let's have a look at some actual polar orbits. This was taken from right down at the South Pole. And look at how many zip across the sky at night. It's very pretty. A polar orbit is useful for mapping the Earth's surface and for tracking weather. That reminds me of what we observed in Google Maps. Here in the Google Maps satellite view, it's easy to see all these strips or these lines going from north to south. And when you zoom in right between the columns, you can get an idea of just how far away the satellite really was when it took the picture. Yeah, it looks like that picture could have been taken from a plane. Some imagery is taken from a plane, but I think you just tried to diss the missus. And as we all know how hard the couch is, don't we boys and girls? She said it was taken from far, far away, not from a plane. That definitely doesn't look like it was taken from this high up. If it was, I think each of the strips would be much wider and you would probably see some clouds below. Clouds below? Well, if there were clouds below, they would simply take the images another time. Because remember, they're trying to see the ground, not the clouds. As for how wide that strip is, wouldn't the camera with a big old zoomy lens see much closer? Like this little boat here that's stuck in a canal taken from the ISS with a big old zoom lens. Let's have a look at Sochi the astronaut on the ISS playing with cameras. See, he's got a small one, and now he's got a big one. This one's got a huge lens. Oh, look, Mum, no hands. And look what they were able to see from the ISS with that huge lens. But first, we must show where and when and with what. A little bit of metadata is tight, because, boys and girls, it's all nice, because boys and girls, it's nice to provide evidence, isn't it? And now let's zoom in to, shall we count the tugboats? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and more. Wow, 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 isn't that expensive? Most satellites follow slightly elliptical orbits around the Earth. The point closest to the Earth in the orbit is called perigee. The point farthest from the Earth in the orbit is called apogee. The satellite travels fastest at perigee and slowest at apogee. Yeah, there's been some discussion about that on our debate board, but so far it has just been people claiming that it is possible, not really explaining how it is possible. For the sun to have a stronger attractive force on one side of it than the other, which creates the elliptical orbit. And now they appear to be claiming it is the same thing with the Earth. If that is the case, then I would expect people on one side of the Earth to be heavier than the people on the other side of the Earth. Okay, kids, lift your hand and slap your face. See, that's what we do. He really doesn't understand how elliptical orbits work at all, does he? Let's do a drawing for him. Let's show the ISS orbit and a geostationary orbit. Now, we know the speeds of these two because of the distances is different. We know the speeds are different at these two different distances, so isn't it just logical that an elliptical orbit with a perigee at 420 kilometers and an apogee of 36,000 kilometers would just vary its speed to match its altitude? And as for that pesky variable gravity, the gravity at the satellites is varying. But remember, gravity is inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. Fat people? What a silly billy. To stay in orbit, a satellite must maintain a speed adequate for its altitude. See, there you go. Too easy. Barely an inconvenience. Now, here is something I'm wondering about. As we know, if I were to jump off of the top of a ladder, 
It'll hurt more than if I were to jump off the bottom of it. That is because the more time I spend falling, the faster I fall. Now, if a satellite is perpetually falling around the Earth, why isn't it continually going faster and faster, just like me jumping off of the top of a ladder? I'm sorry, kids, but you know what you have to do. Raise your hand and... That one basic observation of falling seems to utterly destroy the traditional concept of how satellites are supposed to work. It's simple, really. You're falling, but you keep missing. If I use some big words, on the ladder you're exchanging gravitational potential energy for kinetic energy. However, in orbit you're staying the same height above the Earth, so there's no loss in gravitational potential energy, and therefore no increase in kinetic energy. It's really rather easy. The space shuttle, however, is an exception. This temporary satellite is designed to carry cargo, orbit the Earth, and then return to the Earth's surface. While in orbit, the shuttle can release or pick up other satellites. Well, that finishes all of Chapter 2. Yes, it seems they don't have any comments about the space shuttle. It's a pity. I was hoping to get to say Namibia. Can you say Namibia? It's fun to say Namibia, isn't it, Adam? Well, there you have it, boys and girls. And as a special treat for all of you people who persevered and made it right to the end, I'm going to let the cute little Professor Emma explain some rocket science to us. Take it away, Emma. Thanks, guys. Hey, yeah. That's looking good so far. And then, add this. Mm-hmm. Now what? That's it. And what else? How does the rocket go? Boom! And the fire. The fire. Yeah. What a good rocket. Is that? Is that Emma's rocket? Emma, can you explain what you just drew on the board? What is it? A rocket. A rocket. And what's the red stuff coming out of the bottom? No orange. Orange. Okay. What is it? Fire. That's the fire. Mm -hmm. And how does the rocket go? Boom. Very good. <laughs>